that is an application that doesn't necessarily want to play by the rules. So it's out there, it's often um, trying to look like something else. Um, a lot of those peer-to-peer -peer applications, sometimes they have some signaling to say, here is my file list, where's your file list, here's what um, I'm willing to swap, um, broadcasting who's on the network, where are the, the peers, stuff like that. But then when I ask you for your, your, your copy of uh, Finding Nemo, um, somewhere independently, um, there'll be a transaction started for the actual download, which could look anything um, like a web transaction or an FTP. So now, um, unless you follow that initial signaling on the peer-to-peer -peer side, you'll see an FTP session, which would have nothing to do, or, or a web session, which would have nothing to do with peer-to-peer. So if you decide that peer-to-peer -peer is something you want to control, um, this is but the actual bandwidth-consuming act is going to be a web transaction. What do you do? And if you decide to control web traffic, now you're shooting all the users who just want to browse. Um, so there's got to be more than um, just um, to connect uh, messages for, for contain set of protocols. <coughs> How yep. do you? Treat fairly a flow uh, that would be a UDP flow and a TCP flow that would have congestion avoidance. But the UDP flow doesn't care, it just flows. Whatever um, speed. Yeah, the UDP there. flows care because often some of the congestion management and, and rate control are done at a higher level, at the application level. Right? But you look at RTP, um, th th there's always a mechanism. Um, and, um, and we deal with it. So I'll, I'll get to it. Yeah. Well, I'll move on with your presentation. I have a feeling a lot of these questions would probably get answered if you got a chance to. <laughs> I wasn't kidding about the 600 slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so just briefly, um, I'm going to talk about the issues that um, before we even get into uh, what we do, um, just finding out what the network is carrying is hard. Um, there's um, some statistics that s switches or routers can provide, but they're all a transport statistics, so how many packets, how many bytes, which ports. You don't know which applications, and even if you wanted to create some kind of a picture, you have to collect from a lot of those elements. This is called mediation. Um, huge level of data uh, collected, aggregated, um, mitigated, um, and at the end, you know how many packets on, on a given port. Not too interesting. Um, if you look at the other direction, it's even more difficult, because if you have some visibility into what your network is doing, um, and now you want to control it. Now it's a many-to-many -many situation. All those back office elements have to talk to a lot of different elements in the network to tell them what to do, which is, is very difficult. So essentially the whole idea of service control is to say, let's have intelligent elements that sit in the network. Let those guys deal with transport and where packets need to go. Let those elements um, contain the per flow, per session uh, picture of what the network is doing, what the users are doing, and be able to report it if you want to track it, be able to control it if you want to control it. Um, uh, uh, so this is, um, uh, the ABC is, you, you got to have insight to know what your network is carrying. You want to be able to monetize um, some aspects of how people use your network. And you want to be able to control um, the network at the application layer to um, curb abuse or whatever you consider to be abusive as a carrier, um, to be able to differentiate so you can sell or offer different tiers of service at different price points, etc. Um, so some examples, um, the, the, the simplest is just simple statistics by profiling the kind of applications uh, being utilized by the subscriber base. So one of the, the, the first things people do with our box is put the box in the input for a while and then say, Show me the top, the heaviest 5%, uh, say, web users, which typically are people running a successful website at home, which they're not supposed to. Because often the acceptable use policy says, this is, a, if you want to run a business, uh, come in as a business customer. But if you're a residential user, we don't want you to run a very successful website at home because it's going to offset all our network planning. Um, you look at the top 5% um, heaviest email users. That's typically your spammers. Um, and we talked about spam a little bit before 
before I came up. Um, spam is a very difficult problem, but what we've realized is um, if you can see on your network who are the largest contributors, you can set limits and say, you can send 100 emails a day, you can send 1,000 emails a day, but if you're sending 100,000 emails a day, you're up to something. So let's create some kind of a limit and um, enforce it. And that'll be a service to our users and to the world. Well, what does it mean? We see 100,000 emails a day. Um, yeah, that, that's a different problem. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm close to having that problem. <laughs> um, but if you control a lot of, a lot of those who send 100,000 emails a day, there'll be less people receiving 100,000 emails a day. And the other angle here is um, there's a lot of those proxy servers. There's a lot of those, um, they call it zombies, pe people's computers who have been hijacked without their knowledge often and now being used. So some carriers that are using our solution actually are using another capability that we have to redirect um, a session on the fly. So um, when those users come on the network, they automatically get redirected to us and saying, um, you're sending too much email, or you're sending too much traffic, or you're, you're probably, without your knowledge, a part of a denial of service scheme. Here's what you have to do to clear your computer, and then you'll be allowed back on the network. And it's both a service to those users who are often unaware, and a service to the rest of the community, because that contributes to a lot of noise. In terms of volume, by the way, uh, email is not that big. Um, because you get a lot of those um, herbal Viagra emails. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, 100 bytes, could be 500 bytes. Um, um, one download of Nemo is 800 megabytes. But the images, yeah, don't they? Yeah, well, the pretty lady that's the same. Right, though. right. <laughs> so make it uh, 500 bytes. Um, it, 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 it is a lot. From a carrier perspective, on email, they worry less. Um, and, and this is true for AOL, for example. Um, by far, spam is a huge, huge cross item for AOL, uh, but it's because of the storage requirements. Um, they end up with so much intermediate storage for junk that they have to keep increasing to keep up, um, which is a killer. So if you can reduce that by a few percentages, immediate return. Peer-to-peer -peer kill, kills the network. Um, and so, the per user is, is one angle. Um, this is schematic, but I'll show you some real uh, slides. But what this shows is something that um, people already have. Right? So the routers can tell you how much traffic, and you can track it. And typically, there's a this kind of a pattern. Um, you look at uh, depends on what kind of uh, if, if we take AOL, uh, residential people come home, they get connected, um, go to sleep, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as it grows, um, you know you're hitting your limit, um, and you have to increase capacity. And logically, um, first you want to know what is that traffic made up of. And of course, you can drill in at a great detail, and, and often carriers do, because they not only want to know that a lot of the traffic is web, um, they want to know what are the hot sites that drive those traffic. Um, they want to know a lot about their uh, the demographics. Um, from a control perspective, you'd like to be able to say, I want to define limits, and here's the limit for email, and everything beyond that limit, we'll color it red, and we'll see what happens. And you can play what ifs, and the goal is to say, I want the red to be gone. So that, again, my link is manageable. And if I'm under the threshold that anybody trying to do anything on my network will get a, a decent response. So this is the theory. Um, here's what it looks like in real life. Um, all this red is peer to peer. Um, 60 to 70 percent of the traffic everywhere we go is peer to peer. Um, and we're deployed in almost every geography. I can tell you it's the same. Um, the mix of the peer to peer traffic is a little bit different. So it's a lot of Kazan in the United States. Um, Donkey is probably the biggest in Europe. Um, there's protocols like WinMX and Winnie in Japan, names that you've probably never heard of. But, uh, um, deadly. In fact, Winnie is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol which is not only encrypted, it was designed by a combination of um, programmers and lawyers, essentially to create complete plausible deniability. <laughs> it's a very interesting protocol. Um, 
it, it took us a few days to figure it out. But what they've done is to say, um, when you ask me for a file, um, that request goes to me and ten others, and every one of those ten others sends it to three more. And so uh, it's hard to trace who was actually being asked for the file. It goes back the same way. Um, it's encrypted, but in any um, station on the way, it gets decrypted and then re-encrypted to send it out. And you may ask why. The reason is if somebody um, gets a warrant and grabs your computer and finds child pornography on it, mm -hmm. um, you could say, I was just a node on this network. Everything is different. But I didn't ask for this file. I didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. It was en route to somewhere else. Oh my God. There's no way to prove whether um, you were the recipient, you asked for it, you were, yeah. I call it data laundry. That, that was the guy's defense and he got data convicted. Laundry, yeah. There's uh, been a few of those. By the way, one of those guys got acquitted. Um, oh. One was convicted. But but Winnie is uh, has made this into an art. And um, I think I have a graph here from Japan, so you'll see. Japan, most of the PNP traffic now is Winnie. Um, hasn't really moved out of Japan yet. I, I'm not sure why, that, but right? it, it'll get there. <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying is, what's the key to doing a very important technology? And if uh, ISP get a hold of, you know, PQ files and they check out what you need and kill the entire... Um, yeah, so I'll address this to uh, Shutting down peer-to-peer -peer is not an option. Um, and it's not smart. So P2P um, is one of the reasons why people jump on this uh, broadband yeah. bandwagon. So if you're an ISP and you shut it down, that's not going to make you very popular. Um, but you look at the um, stock of permanent about the evolution of P2P. Um, it started with Napster. Um, Napster was about exchanging songs. MP3 files are typically two, three, three megabytes in size. So the usage, usage pattern would be you would search for files you like, you would download them in order to listen to them. Fairly interactive experience. Um, where we are today, um, the big problem, or a lot of the traffic, is not the little MP3 songs. It's those full-length DVD movies, TFX, um, full-size application suites, um, games. Um, so average file size. This a lot of the files files being um, exchanged are in the neighborhood of between 800 megabytes to 1.5 gigabytes per file. So the interactive aspect of this has gone away. Um, you don't sit next to your computer waiting for Nemo to download. Uh, what, what, what is 1.5 gigabytes? That's just incredible. Um, yeah, you look at, you look at a, a full-length DVD, it could be a lot more. How much of these people have? I mean, they can't store more than, what, 30, 40 files? Um, so uh, yeah, what they do is download, burn DVDs, and download more. Yeah, download for days. Yeah, yeah. You, you, day you download speed. a DVD, yeah. you burn it onto a CD-ROM, and you download more. You burn it into a DVD. Yeah. Actually, you have two computers. You have the computer that you lose to use, and then you have the other computer that's sitting on the router that's connected to your broadband keyboard and this doing all your downloading. That's how you do PPP PP, yep. and use the internet. At, and at home. And I can tell at you, home. a lot of people use it at the enterprise. Um, Level, oh yeah, for too long. Which now you got a really big WAN connection. Yeah. So you go home, a, a lot of those enterprises, the, the cubicles have become uh, DVD print shops. Exactly. You come in in the morning, a lot is completed. You I can attest that HP has at least 50 cubicles that are like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what happens when voice over IP starts gaining in popularity? Um, so I'll, I'll show you. Uh, Skype is mentioned here. I don't know if you guys know about Skype. Um, Zenstorm is the guy that uh, put Kazaa together. Um, and uh, yeah. a couple months ago, he introduced Skype, which is the same Kazaa type P2P infrastructure to run voice over IP. Right. And um, while it's not groundbreakingly novel, 